Hey guys, this is Josh with the Depth Tape Channel, and this is my free Diesel 101 course. This is basically the equivalent to a college course you would take, not in an engineering sense, but as a mechanic. And I've taken many diesel courses and automotive courses over the years, and this is basically the same information they would be teaching you. However, I'll be teaching it, and it's free, which are two big differences from what I was exposed to. So. This is basically going to cover the origins of the diesel engine, how they work. We'll get into the fuel systems, air systems, oil, all the components. And this first one, we're basically going to be talking about theory of how it works. We're going to be building our own first diesel engine from our own minds here. So it'll kind of give you an in-depth basis to start at. And this is going to be a base level course. Basically, I'm going to treat this as you have no engine knowledge at all. You graduated high school, you've never even opened the hood on a car. So let's get into the video. So it took me a little while to figure out what would be a good starting place for the diesel engine. And the first thing I could think of was the first place to start would be a book. And this book is Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And many consider it to be the quintessential American novel. If you haven't read it, I recommend it, although it doesn't have a lot to do with diesel engines. It has a lot to do with whaling. Now, what the heck do large sea mammals in the ocean have to do with diesel engines? Well, in the mid-1800s, whales were very important to the economy for a couple reasons. One was they produce something that in two different forms, one was from sperm whales, one was from the other types of baleen whales, and they would create what they call whale oil. You could get a lot of whale oil, something like 1,800 quarts or something from a, a single sperm whale. And this oil was used for lamps and was also used for different industrial processes like lubrication of machinery, things like that. Whale oil is actually quite a good lubricant in certain instances. In fact, while doing research for this, I learned that they used whale oil in automatic transmissions up into the 1970s. And if you don't believe me, go look it up. I think you'll be surprised by that. I did not know that. That was kind of interesting. Now, of course, anyone with a basic understanding of history realizes that, of course, whales are not an infinite resource. And not only that, they're very dangerous to get and costly to get. Now, there are other places you can get oil. And of course, that would be Petroleum. There's also vegetable oil and other items that were developed during the Industrial Revolution, but nothing is as abundant and easily processed as petroleum, also known as crude oil. And as the whale population started to decrease and they were looking for a more reliable and easier and cheaper way to produce oil for machinery, of course, this black goop that people have known about for thousands of years, petroleum, is coming out of the ground in certain places. Now, if this could be tapped and harnessed, it would be a huge boon for the economy. Not only that, it would enable machinery to have a seemingly endless supply of fuel and lubrication. So whaling kind of led into the use of petroleum. And that's important to understand, at least for the history sake of it. Now, there weren't any cars, there weren't any airplanes when this was going on in the mid 1800s but there were still machines there were the steam engine of course which didn't use whale oil however it was a either coal or wood powered steam engine and steam's a very interesting engine type because it is very easy to replenish the fuels for it if you're using coal that's very plentiful or wood and you're out in the west on a train you can of course find lots of wood and of course, the medium for the steam engine is water, which of course is usually found all over the place. The problem with the steam engine, however, and another thing with a steam engine, you could use literally any fuel to power a steam engine. You could burn gasoline or kerosene to create the steam to use a steam engine. However, the problem is it's an efficiency problem. A steam engine is only about five to 10% efficient. That means you pour in a gallon of fuel for a steam engine, you burn it to create steam, to create propulsion of your train, only 10% of that fuel 
is getting used for the propulsion. The rest is wasted in the heat process. So while steam engine is extremely simple and easy to produce, especially in the early industrial revolution, it had many problems, mostly due with efficiency. So people in the late 1800s with petroleum, when it started getting distilled and used, especially for kerosene for lamps, started to think there's got to be a more efficient way to use this natural resource known as petroleum, which is then distilled. Now, distilled petroleum, crude oil, does not just turn into all diesel or all gasoline or all kerosene. In the distillation process, similar to like how milk is separated into skim and cream and whole milk, the fuel, the crude oil, is turned into different items. To take a closer look at this distillation process, you can see as crude oil is distilled, it becomes propane, petrol, which would be gasoline, kerosene, diesel, and you can tell by the weight how heavy the fuel or oil is. So diesel is more towards the bottom. It's a heavier fuel, so needed a way to figure out how to use that fuel. Now, the first man to basically invent the diesel engine is the man that it's named after, Rudolf Diesel, who was a German inventor around the turn of the century from the 1800s to the 1900s. And in the 1890s, he was working on a compression ignition engine. And strictly speaking, a compression ignition engine is a diesel engine, opposed to a spark ignition engine, which would be like a gas engine or a natural gas engine or a propane engine. Compression ignition does not rely on spark. And there's a big difference with that because it changes a lot of the components and the fuel types you can use. Diesel does not burn very easily in a gasoline engine, and gasoline doesn't work very well in a diesel engine. So you can use the different fuels in different types of engines and utilize the natural resource of petroleum better after its distillation process. Now, the main reason they were doing this was, of course, the efficiency of the engine. Now, diesel engines run about a 30% efficiency, give or take, every engine's different. So we're talking, if you're going from 5% to 30%, that's a six-fold increase in efficiency. Now, of course, the first models of the diesel engine weren't running that efficient, but they were still 15, 16% efficient. So almost a three times increase over the steam engine. So the very principle you could see had a lot of potential in it. However, it's a fairly complicated engine compared to a steam engine because you're just relying on a boiler and then steam pressure. So let's theorize and talk about what makes up a diesel engine and what you need for it to operate. Okay, so the basics of a diesel engine, we are going to theorize like we're going to have to invent our a first compression ignition engine ourselves. None has been invented yet. Now, one good thing about a diesel opposed to a spark ignition engine is you do not need any sort of electrical input since you're not making a spark. You could have a fully mechanical diesel engine. This would require no battery, nothing electrical. It would be strictly mechanical, unlike on a gas engine where you always have a spark plug. So you have this natural resource. You have petroleum, which makes diesel, and then you have all this energy. A gallon of diesel has about 35,000 calories in it, which compared to a gallon of milk, about 10 times as much. So you have all this energy, and you want to efficiently use it to power a machine. And the machine you're powering doesn't really matter. It could be a piece of earth moving equipment. It could be a car, which hadn't been invented yet. It could be a train, which had been used for several decades. Machinery and manufacturing, almost limitless possibilities. So... How best to utilize this diesel fuel? Now, diesel fuel is not easily ignited. If you just pour it on a table and put a match in it, it's not going to light. You need to get it under pressure, and it needs to be exposed to a lot of heat. So what if you put it in a can? Let's say you took a can, and you took the lid off, and this was a big steel heavy can, and you poured a little bit of diesel fuel in, and then you took a pump like a bike pump and you pumped it up and you had to figure out a way then to ignite the fuel right that's an issue not only that the diesel fuel if you pour it in will just be in a puddle on the bottom it's 
best igniter when it's atomized, when it's a mist. So you would need something where you're actually going to spray the diesel fuel in with it under heat and under pressure. Now, if you take a can and you pressurize it, let's say you take this same canister and you, you put a lid on it and you pump it up with a bike pump and you create 800 PSI of pressure in there. Well, compressing all those air molecules initially is going to heat them up because all the heat in those air molecules is going to be compressed. And maybe that'll be hot enough to light this diesel fuel. Well, the downside to that is once you're done compressing it, the heat's going to start dissipating through the machine, through the canister, because heat goes from higher heat intensity to lower heat intensity. So you'd have to somehow get this canister and pump it up really fast and then try to spray in your diesel fuel with some sort of mister or something under pressure very rapidly. Now, if you were to say do that quick enough, you could create a compression ignition explosion, which would cause the diesel fuel that is sprayed in to ignite and then compress. It would burn up all the oxygen. But where would the pressure go? You would then just wind up with a canister under pressure that would then have a lot more pressure because you'd had an explosion that going on it. So you have a canister and, but what does that do? You've just created a bunch of pressure. Well, this pressure, you need to harness that pressure. Remember the steam engine had steam pressure that was used to move things. So you need something that when you explode it, it would force something to move and moving this item you could utilize the movement of that item as a machine and with that machine you could do all sorts of stuff you could put it through a transmission that would go through a differential that would turn your wheels it could be used on some sort of crop harvesting machine it could be used in any sort of textile industries pretty much anything that could spin or rotate could be used by this machine so you'd need to take that canister you had and put a hole in the bottom of it. And then you'd need to fill that hole almost completely up with something that would move, right? Now, what would you call that? Well, you would call that a cylinder. And the thing moving inside of it, you would call a piston. Now, this is a piston. I believe this is out of a 3208 Caterpillar engine. And you can see from the char marks that this has had millions of revolutions on it. Millions of these explosions we're theorizing about. And to make this piston, it would also have to be subjected to the heat and the intensity of the liner, so, or the cylinder. So you would need to make it out of something hard, like forged aluminum or steel. Now, the problem is, is the piston needs to be able to move in the cylinder. So it can't be the same size as the cylinder. The problem with that being is what happens to metal as it expands or i'm sorry as metal heats up as metal heats up it expands so if you had a piston that was one tenth of a millimeter smaller than your cylinder that's moving up and down in as that cylinder was getting heated up by the combustion process the piston itself would actually expand to the point where it would grab against the cylinder and what would happen then is when you combust it, it would grab against the cylinder. And if there was enough pressure, it would dig into the sides of the cylinder and push down in the cylinder and ruin the cylinder, basically. You get heavy vertical scoring. This still happens, actually. And how does this happen? Well, this is generally seen on engines that are severely overheated. If you get your engine up to about 250 degrees, depending on the engine, most diesel engines, you'll get what they call four corner seizure. So what happens is four sides of this piston will expand to the point that they start touching the cylinder walls and in the up and down motion, it'll just destroy the cylinder. There'll be so many heavy grooves in it that the cylinder's destroyed. So basically you need a way to move the piston up and down in the cylinder while creating this explosion that would harness the energy and force the piston down but not have the piston contacting the cylinder walls. So you would need something that is somewhat movable, but also extremely strong, and is gonna fill up the gap between the piston 
and the cylinder wall. And maybe you could use rubber. The problem is high heat and high temperature, so that would burn off. You would need to use something like metal, just like this piston does. It says metal piston ring, and what they call an oil control ring, but we'll talk about those later. So you have your piston, and then you invent your piston rings, which have a gap, and the gap's there to allow for expansion, because remember the cylinder, when you put it in the cylinder, it's gonna compress this, and you need a little bit of a gap. If there was no gap, the ring would break immediately once it heated up. Okay, so in our theoretical engine here, we have a cylinder now, we have a piston, and we have piston rings. So you now have a canister and a piston, and not only that, the piston is gonna help create this force of air pressure, because when you push the piston up in the cylinder now, instead of using your high-powered bicycle pump to create all this air pressure, moving the piston up in the cylinder will create tons of air pressure and tons of heat by compressing all those air molecules. So we don't need our bike pump anymore. Piston's gonna do that for us. Now, what about a way to get fuel in the cylinder? Using a mister doesn't really work. You need some sort of extremely reliable way to fire and mist the fuel into the cylinder when the air is compressed. Well, that is where we get an injector. And injector's not really a good term for it. It'd actually be a nozzle. Now a nozzle, just like a hose nozzle, when you put pressurized liquid fuel in this case through it, it's gonna atomize it, kind of like a mister, except this was made out of steel instead of a plastic bottle. Now the nozzle is gonna be supplied with high pressure fuel, and when it gets to high enough pressure, it's gonna spray a mist of diesel fuel into the cylinder, which has been pressurized by the piston, and it's then going to ignite once the fuel hits the superheated air and pressure. Once it's ignited, it's gonna force that piston back down, okay? Now we've identified certain parts already. We've identified the piston, the importance of the piston rings, the nozzle, the cylinder itself. Now, there's many other components we need to add to this to make it a functional machine because what does what's holding onto the piston? The piston just moving up and down. You'd have to push it up with your hand or whatever, and then it would just push down, and then you'd have to push it up again. So you need a way of a machine that when the explosion happens, it would push the piston down in the cylinder. It would then need a way to move back up in that cylinder. So you would need a, something that would connect to the piston, some sort of rod that connects to the piston to something that's spinning. So this is called a wrist pin. This connects to something called a connecting rod because it's a rod that connects to the piston. And the other part of that that it's going to connect to is something called a crankshaft. Now a crankshaft is where your vertical movement of the piston up and down on the cylinder gets converted into rotary movement because the crankshaft is moving in a circle. Meanwhile, the piston's moving vertically. And the way it does that is when it fires, the connecting rod is moving around the, the uh, crankshaft. So it's always the end of the crank or the end of the connecting rod that's bolted to the crank is always going in a circle. Meanwhile, the end of the connecting rod that's connected to the piston is always moving vertically. So that's how you convert your downward force of the piston into rotary force, which is much more usable. There's not a lot you can do with just a back and forth motion unless you're running like a, a saw or something. So you have now found a way to convert your downward pressure of the piston through the connecting rod into the crankshaft and the crankshaft will spin and that spinning motion, you can harness that energy. And like I said, most of the energy, not most, but a large percentage of the energy is gonna be retained and go directly into the crankshaft for use for whatever your application is. So we now have a nozzle that sprays the fuel. We have a piston, piston ring, connecting rod, and a crankshaft. Okay, so we have a lot of the parts that are in a diesel engine already that we've theorized and figured out ourselves, right? 
Now, one thing we haven't addressed yet is air. You need oxygen. Now, air has oxygen in it, but it's not mostly oxygen. There's only a percentage of oxygen, but most of it's actually nitrogen, which, of course, you can't burn. You need oxygen for combustion. So, the way we were talking about it before, you were compressing air. It was getting hot. It was igniting with the fuel, and then pushing the piston down, and then the piston was coming back up. The problem with that is if you were to take your cylinder and put your piston in it and then do that once, compress the air, ignite it, push the piston down and come back up, when it comes back up, it's not compressing air with oxygen in it anymore. You have burned the oxygen and you've created carbon dioxide because you've added carbon from the fuel and ignited it with the oxygen. Now you have carbon dioxide, which is not useful because you need oxygen so okay well that's a problem because how are we supposed to get air in our cylinder every single time then we would need a way to move air fresh air into the cylinder turn that device off so that the air is trapped in the cylinder so that when the piston comes back up in the cylinder, it is now compressing your fresh air. When that ignites with the spraying of the nozzle, forcing the piston down, that air is going to be superheated and create a lot of pressure. It's also going to burn up all the oxygen. And then on the next stroke up, that piston is going to have to force out all of the carbon dioxide, unburned fuel, and exhaust air, it's exhausted air, out of somewhere. So you may have a single, let's call it a valve. Let's say, let's say you have an, an air valve that you could open. It would let air in as the piston's coming down. You would then close it before the piston comes back up. It would compress this air, ignite it. The piston would go back down on a downward stroke, burning all the oxygen. And then when the piston comes back up to compress the now exhausted air, you'd have to open that valve again, but now you wouldn't be allowing fresh air in because there's all this pressure and heat in there. You'd have to let that air out. Now, the problem is if you use a single air valve, you would be pushing that exhausted air into the same manifold as the fresh air incoming to the cylinder. So that doesn't work very well. So instead of having a single valve on this stroke that's taking four four different actions here. We have an intake of air, we have a compression of air, we have the ignition powering the piston down, and then we have the exhaust of the, the exhausted air being pushed out. You have an intake, compression, power, and exhaust stroke. So you'd want an air, you'd want two valves. One would allow fresh air in that would close when the piston starts coming back up in the cylinder to compress the air. And then you'd want a different valve to open after the pistons come down after the power stroke to let the exhausted air out into a different manifold. Now this would create what we call the four-stroke cycle, four-stroke engine cycle. We just figured it out. We have an intake, compression, power, and exhaust. Now there's a simpler version we're not going to be going into in this video called a two-stroke cycle, but it they're very, nah, they're dirtier running and you don't really see them that much anymore. And the four stroke cycle is pretty much everything you're gonna see. So we're gonna focus on that four stroke cycle, we'll say the two stroke cycle for another video. So we now have, we now have an engine. You've just created your first diesel engine. It has a piston, a cylinder, you have valves, you have a nozzle that will spray fuel in there. You have a crankshaft, connecting rod, and a liner or cylinder. So that would be basically the first diesel engine that Rudolph Diesel invented. And understanding those principles will help you understand how a diesel engine works. And that will also be the conclusion of our first class. You have now figured out all the minor component or major components of a diesel engine. Now, there are many other components, but we're going to be focusing on those in the next class. A lot of those have to do with opening and closing the valves. How do you time those? 
How do you push fuel into the nozzle? It doesn't just drip in there. What keeps the crankshaft from seizing up? What keeps the cylinders cool? There's a lot of extra components, but we've identified all the major ones that basically take place inside and contribute to the cylinder and the combustion cycle, okay? Hope you enjoyed this video. I'll be making more of these and we'll be elaborating on this process and then start talking about the actual diesel difference. We're talking about air fuel ratios, all that stuff in the future videos. So hopefully you liked the video. If you did, please click the like button and if you haven't, subscribe. Thank you.